I'm going to attempt to explain God and creation in about 10 minutes. Pay attention because this is going to move fast. Let's begin by imagining that the supreme source that is God as a son. I'm not saying God is the son. I'm just saying as a starting point, imagine God as a son. This son is alone in the universe, which kind of defeats the purpose of a son. It's a sad circumstance to be alone in the universe. In fact, there is a scientific question if this sun even exists at all if it is alone and unobserved. Clearly, the sun has to do something to justify its existence because it cannot exist alone. It is necessary for the sun to sacrifice a part of itself and create a projection of energy that will always be one and connected with the sun but gives it definition and allows the light of the sun to shine throughout the universe. This projection of the sun forever alters the light emanating from the sun and directs it to work and do the most good. So now you have a sun that is the father, a projection of the sun's energy that is the sun, and the light that emanates from the sun is the Holy Spirit. This dynamic Godhead energy of the sun is God. But God is not just the father, God is also the divine mother. So the sun should be called both mother and father. What we often call the sun is also both a feminine and masculine energy, and often manifests in our physical world as Christ incarnate. Individuals such as Mother Mary, Jesus, Joan of Arc, Krishna, or Buddha. So the Son is better labeled as the Christ Consciousness. The Holy Spirit does not imply either male or female energy, but it doesn't really describe the role of the Holy Spirit, which could be better described as the vital energy of God. But let's not confuse the issue and just keep calling it the Holy Spirit. So you may say this is a fair example to understand the nature of God, but what does it have to do with creation? Well, you know that sun that I said is the supreme source that is God? I lied about it. God is not the sun. God is the universe. And the light of God that I said is the Holy Spirit? Well, it's not really light. It's vibration. All of this appearing together is the Big Bang. Okay, so maybe this explains the existence of the universe. But what about our world and us? Well, there's one thing I neglected to tell you. The supreme source that is God and is the universe? exists in ten dimensions. Einstein and modern string theory both suggested that originally the universe existed in ten dimensions, but was unstable in ten dimensions, which caused the Big Bang. This correlates with what I just suggested, that the ten-dimensional supreme source that is God could not exist alone as the universe which created the Big Bang. But how does that explain us in our little three-dimensional world? Well, the Big Bang didn't just happen in the tenth dimension. It also happened in the ninth dimension and the eighth dimension. In every descending dimension, the energy of God became denser and the vibrations lower. When the Big Bang reached the sixth dimension after just seconds or milliseconds, it was obvious to the creative force of the Christ consciousness that the density of God's vibration manifest in the Holy Spirit would eventually result in solid matter. So by the time the energy and vibration descended to the fifth dimension, plans were in place for the creation of stars, galaxies, suns, solar systems, and planets. The fourth dimension became the model for the creation of our world, and the energy which animates us and our planet could not descend any further and remained in the fourth dimension. The density of the third dimension was used to create everything we see in the cosmos, and eventually, after perhaps billions of years, resulted in plant and animal life. But how does that explain us and our reasoning minds? Well, you remember that original ten-dimensional supreme source that is God in the universe? Well, I also neglected to say that it is also you. So what that means is that you exist in a three-dimensional world of your own making. Okay, you may say, but why did the chain reaction of the Big Bang stop at the third dimension? Well, it didn't. But our traditional depiction of three dimensions, height, width, and depth, doesn't really describe our reality. We need a better way to understand the three dimensions of our physical existence. You know it is often said that nothing physical actually exists outside of your perception. Well, when it comes to the physical world, that is actually true. So what really defines our three-dimensional existence is our brain, or rather our three brains. The most basic one-dimensional level is the animal instinctual brain. The second dimension of our perception is the emotional brain. And finally, the third density, rational intellectual brain. This descent from the tenth dimension to our current existence in the first, second, and third densities is the fall of man. 
This is also depicted as the tree of life, which is most familiarly and accurately depicted in the Kabbalistic tree of life. But this isn't so much a depiction of the fall as it is a roadmap back to full integration with our divine selves. We only have a path back to the divine because when we descended to the density of the sixth dimension, our Christ consciousness understood the completeness of our fall and made preparations by creating our astral body for us. And in this case, God really did create us in his own image, that of a multidimensional astral being consisting of both male and female identities. That is why the sixth density is often called the causal plane because our Christ consciousness caused everything that comes after to come into existence. At the core of this new body, we are also given something that is indispensable on our cosmic journey, and that is karma, which is often confused with the universal law of cause and effect, or in simpler terms, what goes around comes around. But cause and effect is only one of the laws that govern karma, not the essence of karma. Karma is more correctly described as a personalized learning plan designed to aid us on the beginning of our journey back along the tree of life. Our astral body was created to exist in the fifth density of creation, or what we often call the astral plane, or even heaven if you will. Even though creation extends down through the densities of the fourth, third, second, and first dimensions, our astral bodies are of light enough vibrations and densities to remain in the fifth dimension, or the astral plane. We could stay there forever if we so wanted, but we wouldn't be making any progress back along the tree of life. We'd be stuck in place on the astral plane. That's because our karmic core, the essence of our astral being, is inert on the astral planes. It is only active on the physical planes. For those of us readying ourselves to exercise our karma in the three-dimensional world, we descend with our karmic core and some of our astral energy to the fourth density, but we leave behind a good portion of our energy on the astral plane. Some of our energy always remains in the fourth and fifth dimension. The fourth dimension is sometimes called the etheric plane or the vital plane. It's a mirror image of the earth, and our vital energy that abides on the fourth density actually animates our physical bodies. This etheric body is often referred to as our aura. One thing you may be beginning to realize by now is that these different dimensions are not really different places, just different densities of the same place. Before mankind began despoiling our own planet, the etheric plane was literally the Garden of Eden. And you remember from the Bible in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, which of course along with the serpent are simply archetypes for each one of us and not actual persons, were given two trees to help us on our journey. One, the tree of life, is a constant aid, and we are told to freely partake of its fruit. But we are also given the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it was forbidden to eat the fruit. While in the garden, before descending to the physical plane, we literally could not partake of the tree, because good and evil are human constructs originating on the physical plane. The warning is only for those spirits descending to the density of the physical plane. So the tree of knowledge is both a promise and a warning. The promise is that we will experience good and evil through the false delusions of our three brains. And the warning is not to fall prey to the weaknesses of the ego produced by those delusions. The only way to enter the physical plane with the karmic core of your astral body intact is through the act of childbirth. For this purpose, an appropriate biological vehicle was created for our sojourn on the physical plane, a body that probably did not originate on this planet, but that's a whole other discussion. But our birth and death are essential aspects of karma and our journey along the tree of life, because the only way to complete our fall from the divine source so we can begin our journey back is to incarnate on a physical world and experience firsthand the densities of the first, second, and third dimensions. So our path back takes us on our karmic journey through repeated incarnations on physical worlds, learning to defeat our ego so we are no longer partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Completing our karmic journey and overcoming our ego is often referred to as enlightenment. Because we no longer have the karmic core, we would shed our fifth density astral bodies and ascend to the sixth density of the causal plane. From there, our journey would continue back to full integration with the universe and the divine. The passage through these upper densities is beyond our mortal comprehension, but it should be enough for us to understand that we have a plan and a roadmap.